Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Ketzer Shulchan Aruch, the bridge code of Jewish law. We are doing chapter 34, sorry, 33, 33, and we're up to number nine. Actually, technically up to number eight, but it's not something that really applies nowadays. That people used to um, uh, put metal at the season on food and at the time of the season change. But it's not a, it's not something that people do. So we'll go straight to nine. Okay. So uh, chapter thirty three, number nine, Simon Lamad Gimel Siftes. Okay. mashkim adam It's it's also it's forbidden to eat food or drink that people find disgusting, that is repulsive. So in other words, things that are spoiled and it smells, right? So it's uh it's forbidden for, for a few reasons. So the reason that that uh we're going to mention Alta Shaksu. There's a prohibition, there's a verse that we shouldn't be disgusting. And this applies to a lot of a lot of different um things. But in this uh chapter in particular, we're we're discussing things that are forbidden because of danger. Right? So eating spoiled foods is uh is dangerous. Now, people might say, Well, you know, it's pretty obvious who eats rotten food. <laughs> Or spoiled, spoiled things. You know, it's disgusting. But um, don't forget, not that long ago with pre-refrigeration, and also people were were a lot poorer than we are today. Uh, you know, today Baruch Hashem, we live quite a high standard of living relative to the past. You know, even someone who lives in a very with a very limited income, someone has very basic apartment you know it's, so today people with uh, just with running water uh sewage a few basic appliances an oven a vacuum cleaner you know it's like uh people used to live with a hundred servants you know the you have to, people have to chop wood they have to schlap water they have to you know what today we we uh Hashem, we live a very high standard of living relatively speaking to the past and uh, we, Baruch Hashem, we do take it for granted, but we shouldn't. But um, so Baruch Hashem, uh, most people today are able to have reasonably fresh food. Uh, even a lot of things that we don't call fresh by our modern standards are relatively fresh. You know, but anyway, so we shouldn't have, we shouldn't eat food that's that's repulsive. That's it's gone rotten. It's spoiled. It smells. Or from disgusting vessels, so that the shebenafsha adam cuts behem that people find disgusting. So the filthy, uh, you know, they're not cleaned. They got food on them. They also smell. Similarly, we shouldn't eat with dirty hands. Shekal elo hemat beklal. All of these things are included in the rule, the uh, the general prohibition. Of altashaksel es nafshe don't make yourselves disgusting. Right, so there's uh there's a lot of things we 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 first mentioned this in the uh, second or third chapter, talking about someone that that uh, doesn't go to the bathroom when they need to, right? They hold on excessively, right? So uh, that's also about the shaksel making oneself disgusting. So there's that applies to a lot of things, but over here. It's uh, it's things that the per a regular person would find repulsive. Even if someone says, "I don't have any problems," works for me. Butler data eats a called Adam. This person's viewpoint is nullified relative to all other people. So what we do is we we'll look at what 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 regular people uh, find uh, disgusting, repulsive. And that's what we shouldn't have. So as we said, although we, um, we're mentioning this here in respect to the laws of uh, Baltashaksu not being disgusting, but it's um, 
in the chapter of, of things that are dangerous to do. What we need to avoid because it's dangerous. Okay. Number 10. Behema oif shayim sekonim. You have an animal or a bird and it's it's dying. Right? So it's uh so there's different types of dying over here. So we have an animal that is called the trefa. It's not what we're speaking about. So a trefa, I mean today the word trefa has just become uh used as a slang for anything that's not kosher, right? Anything that's not kosher is, is treif. But the technical definition of treifa, Allah I mean, literally the word means an animal that was torn. You know, so in, in the in the Pasuk, in the verse in the Torah it speaks of an animal that was, say, attacked by a wolf or something, and it got it got clawed, it got torn. So uh, that's what the word means literally, but the halachic category means any animal uh, that's not going to live for a year. And obviously, we don't know the, the how long anyone or anything is going to live, but uh, according to laws of nature, it has this issue. So uh, in kosher animals, the most uh, common, at least in Europe, um, were various lung diseases. Right, Various lung diseases due to the cold winters. Um, today, um, it's not as big an issue. Today in America, the biggest issue with, with trape is normally um, it's eaten something and it's it's punctured the intestines or you know somewhere in there which also uh, is a trefer so these these animals so traf is an animal that's that's not going to live 12 months now trefer even if you shecht it it's not kosher so this is why after they shecht animals they have to check various organs of the animal and um and see if it's good and this was tra traditional. I mean, all this is done in before it comes to consumer nowadays. But traditionally, in the past, this was you hear the stories of people taking the chicken to the rabbi for them to uh, check something. Is because you know, and people used to take their own chicken to a shaykhat, they would check it. You know, people uh, took out the feathers by hand usually, and they uh, salted it and everything themselves, and uh, they would have to check various uh, interior organs and. Um, if they saw a problem, they took it to the rabbi. So all of that pretty much happens pre-consumer. We're not, so we're not talking about a tray for now. So we're talking about something that it's it has another issue, whatever it happens to be. So this animal has a, uh, it's it's in a life-threatening situation, um, but it's not it's not a tray for. So I can't think of a good example. I don't know. Maybe it's got some type of uh, disease. I was bit by a snake, but it could survive. You know, something like that. But nishchatu, and they shechted it. So afa pisha hutra So even though technically this is kosher to eat this animal because it was shechted, medaktikim, someone who's very careful. They're scrupulous, you know, they want to make sure that they do the right thing. They should be strict on themselves and not eating, not eat it. So uh, again, this is this is uh this is not because of a cautious issue, this is because of danger to one's life, because whatever it's it's sick with, whatever the problem is, um God forbid it could be transferable. Okay, so this is just joined us. Welcome, chapter 33, number 11. Simon Lamed Gimel, Sif Yudalov. Okay, next. Um, we have the prohibition of Bal Tashchis. So this this is uh, applies to a lot of things. So literally, well, let's talk about generally. The general rule about Tashkis is, is not to waste. So Hashem gave us permission to use the world, and we're allowed to use the resources. Um, but we, we shouldn't wantonly destroy, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't waste, and we shouldn't abuse uh, the world. So we have permission. Hashem gave us permission 
to shech the animals, to chop down trees, to use whatever natural resources we 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 need. But it but it should be with you know you can't just wantingly destroy or or wipe out or you know various things. So um you know today unfortunately most of the uh the greens and the, and the environmentalists actually aren't that interested in the environment anymore. It's more uh um very extreme liberal ideas. You know, in Australia the, the Greens Party only has one one uh international policy that's anti Israel. <laughs> that's that's uh that's their only policy. But um Hello. Can I ask you a question, please? Sure. If it is food that has a very specific smell, it's definitely not spoiled. For example, herring or something pickled or uh, right. sometimes even lox. It's not a spoiled food, but it has a very <laughs> distinguished, very sometimes for some people, not the most pleasant smell. How yeah. do you act with that in this situation? Yeah, this look, someone who doesn't like the smell of herring, it's their problem. <laughs> <laughs> Good herring. Oh, okay. No, no, I mean it's uh no, I, look, here, that's right. Some food or you have certain cheeses have very strong uh yeah, sure smell. Sure. But I think but that that's the normal smell for that food. I mean okay. maybe yes. manners is uh you know, not to have it in a in a confined uh, workplace lunchroom, a small <laughs> small room, but no. Uh, Maybe, okay. but um, but That's it's not it. a fucking problem. It's not yeah. the problem. No. Okay, it's, thank it's you. Things so that much. are like spoiled, you know. Mm -hmm. That's uh, um, but good question because some people. Uh, <laughs> but I think what happens is a lot of those things. It's more cultural. People, uh, right. you know, you have you have certain places that are the only two spices that ever used are salt and pepper, and even those in moderation. I'm asking because. Sometimes when we have a company, people will say, please remove this spoiled smelly fish. And it's actually hearing. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it's funny. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, no problems. So, um, so Baltashism means not to destroy. So that, that's the general prohibition. The specific prohibition and uh, its root um, prohibition is not to chop down fruit trees, right? So uh, you need some wood to build with, by all means. But fruit trees can be beneficial to uh, beneficial to society. So to chop down fruit trees when they're still producing fruit is uh, is problematic. And the example that the Torah gives is even at a time of war, when you're besieging a city. Now, we're not speaking about a life-threatening situation. Life-threatening situation is we know almost everything um, goes out the window. So if the only way to save one's life or someone else's life in a, in a time of war is to destroy fruit trees, so, so be it. But often, in the case of a siege, whoever's besieging from the outside uh, has, has some choice as to, as to what they use. So they should only chop down trees for wood or for siege uh, machines. Um, only trees that are non-fruit bearing. Right? So that's the example that's given. So it's an extreme example. Very good extreme example. But even in a time of war, we have to be careful not to be destructive about things that can help society. Then uh, how much more so in, uh, in, in a regular situation? Can I make so, a comment, Rabbi, please? Yes. Uh, I learned a very interesting tradition, a kind of new tradition in Israel. When they eat any type of fruits, apples, pears, you name it, they save the seeds. And even if they're in a car, <laughs> they throw the seeds outside. I think it would be a really good idea for most nations to do that because it eventually it grows the tree. It's not yeah. that it's part of the fruit, only seeds. 
I saw it myself when I was in Israel. It was very amazing to me. Okay. And so it's kind of a good good idea in my opinion. Yeah. Sounds okay. uh maybe yeah, the first uh... maybe that wasn't the reason why. I mean, they just didn't want to stop and put it in a garbage can. No, it's not Could garbage. Be. It's just only seeds. It's not oh, like seeds. part of the well, fruit. That's what's normally left when you're finished eating a fruit. Yeah, you know, look, it could have been someone also left some because of the tumor mice. It could have been a lot of things, but it could be there's some people who are trying to uh, spread fruit trees. You know, it's... Uh, they go into competition with the JNF forests. The first yeah. time I was in Israel, um, and this is not for for Meiser because it was I was on a kibbutz, a non-religious kibbutz. And I gave somebody an apple and he, he ate the entire thing, the core and everything. And so I realized that's what some people do in Israel. Yeah. They just eat the whole thing. There's a story there was a, a family from Poland. They relocated to Israel, you know, in the 1800s, late 1800s. And, um, you know, they'd spent everything. They get there, they rent an apartment. You now, it wasn't easy in those days. And they get there, and as they're coming into the city, there's someone selling pomegranates. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the seven fruits Israel is blessed with. And uh, they've never seen it before. You know, they, they, they didn't make it to at least the part of Poland they lived in. And they were so excited one of the shivas of men in one of the seven fruits that Israel is blessed with. And uh, this is their first opportunity. They buy a few, they take it home, and it's bitter. And they start crying because it can't be that the fruit's not good. Israel's is blessed with. It must be they're not worthy to be able to enjoy the, the bounty of Israel. The Hashem doesn't see them worthy and they're crying. They've made all this self sacrifice. They're not worthy. And he goes to the shul the first time and people say, Shom Aleich, and they see he's, he's looking quite sad. And they ask him, what's what's wrong? And he tells them that he's they've, they've come and they're not worthy. And he tells them what happened. And uh, people are a bit surprised. One person thinks bitter. It doesn't, you know, if a, if a pomegranate goes bad, it's sour. Bitter is not, you see, says to him, how did you eat it? So he told him, you know, like like an apple, you know, just took a bite from the outside. <laughs> He'd never seen one before, didn't know how to eat it. So they said, no, 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 no. They, they went and they showed him how to eat pomegranate. And they, they ate it, it was sweet, it was delicious. And they, and they were they were excited. All right, so uh, it all depends what you used to. all depends what you used to. That's how it goes. So... Um, Number 11, it's forbidden to cut down a fruit tree that's producing fruit. So uh, th there is a measurement, depends on the, the amount of the, the type of tree. Once it's not producing, it's not viable anymore, it's not profitable. You know, a person wants to use it as wood or they want to plant a new new tree, they can. I um, uh, was a principal of school once where... Um, they they want to expand a building, and there was a date palm, a very established, very large um, date palm in the yard where they wanted to where they wanted to uh, uh, build this building. And um, it was a religious school, and so they 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 transplanted it, and it, it cost a lot now, to transplant um, in the tens of thousands of dollars. The cost to transplant, um, you know, the tree to move it. I'm not sure they're technically obligated to do that, but they, you know, with that kind of expense, because one of the one of the things you could chop down for is if it's to build housing, and uh, or if it's, you know, destroying drains and you know the the roof and and different things, but um, they felt they wanted to go beyond the. Uh, Beyond the call of duty. So, Ilan Zaishu Oisa Raiva Hakawa. Where are we, Rebbe? Sorry? Eric what? Uh, Lama Gimel 33. And Thank we're in you. Number 11. So, this 
is, so it was given an example, an olive tree that produces a quarter of a cav of olives. So uh, a cav is about uh, two, two quarts, approximately. You know, it's different, there's different um, opinions how to, how to transfer the measurements. So it's around about so um, as long as producing that much, it's considered considered viable. The decal oyster cove tomorrow, and a palm tree should produce at least a cove of dates. Now the husa connor. Now it's actually a a danger to cut down the tree. So interesting thing. So number one. Generally, we have this prohibition not to destroy. And Hashem tells us we shouldn't destroy. But this is the chapter that deals with things that are that are dangerous for our health, dangerous to our life. So at least on a, a, a spiritual um, cause, chopping down fruit trees, it's not only wrong, but it's actually danger to one's life. And uh, there's a whole story in the Gemara that... Um, Rabbi Hanina, one of his sons, uh, chopped down a fruit tree. Uh, unnecess well, once unnecessarily, he had a reason, but it was a tree that uh, was still producing fruit. And um, that that caused his death. It was the spiritual cause for, for, his, for his passing. So it's uh, something to be careful of. The Imho Samachalonos Achairos, but if it's near other trees, which is which are a better. So in other words, you know, there's 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 limited resources in this land. You know, often what happens is people uh, plant saplings closer together, then they thin it out. They see which ones because not everyone survives different things. But machish oisam and it's weakening the other trees. Likewise, if it needs its place, so example of building housing. Similarly, if wood for construction is more expensive than the fruit, so then he's able to cut it down. So in all these cases, it's not destructive. It's for a, a positive purpose. So if he's thinning out the, the orchard, so the orchard should go should should produce better quality fruit, more fruit, then that's productive. If it uh, needs to build a house, that's productive. If the wood uh, happens for construction, so again, not just to not to burn, but to uh, to build is more expensive. It's it's more valuable, costs more than the fruit does. That's also it's constructive. So it's not it's not being destructive. Okay. Number twelve. Okay, there are some people who uh, treat the way they, the medical care for stomach pain. They put utensils with hot water on the stomach, and um, the water that we're speaking about is 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 scalding hot. Right, to put warm water is not going to be a danger. But Asalasas came. It's forbidden to do this because it's a danger. A person, it can spill, and a person can get severe burns. God forbid. So, um, you know, people even today, you know, use hot water bottles and, and different things when they have a, uh, sometimes upsets, you know, stomach cramp or something like that. Ready? Yeah. In the old days, I remember there were cases where they used to do it with children, and the cap came off, or the plug came out. And you got yourself badly scalded. Yeah, yeah, God forbid. So you have, to be, you have to be careful. No, so he says you shouldn't use too hot water. Can't use uh, water that's Yadza lettuce boy. So yeah, I don't lettuce. think he's talking about that. I think he's talking about that hot water on your stomach is not good for you. Um, no, it's talking about burning. And uh, in, 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 um, you know, in, um, Full, you know, in Big Shulchan Aruch, it talks about Yatsa Lettuce Boy. Yeah, yeah. Yatsa Lettuce Boy, um, the 
technical literal translation is if you touch something so hot, you're going to pull your hand back out of reflex. So exactly how hot that is, is uh, it's different opinions, but you know, about 110 degrees, most people say. About 110 degrees. Um, people say 42 degrees Celsius. I think that's 109, 110, something like that. So, um, yeah, yes, David. There's a footnote in my Shulchan Arach. It says yep. the Mishnah, the Mishnah Brura, it gives a, the, the chapter and everything, explains that the use of a closed vessel, which will not cause burns, for instance, a hot water bottle, is is permitted. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is more about spilling. So, I mean, if you have something that can be sealed, uh, confidently, then it's not going to be a problem. Um, okay. Okay, 13. It's forbidden to cross the river. That's, it's, it's running. You know, the, it's, it's, you know, uh, where they go white water rafting, <laughs> where it's really the, the, the river's moving, the water's, Really going, you know. Different times of year. Sometimes you get very calm years and rivers, and then when the snow melts or something, or there's there's been a heavy rain further upstream, it just it just goes. So um, yeah, it's a power, powerful current. It says here. Yeah. So it's uh, the water is really moving. So you're not allowed to cross it. Now, if if the water reaches above the the hips, the waist. Right, so if it's going strongly, if it's only ankle deep, you know, probably most people could uh could manage it. But once you're getting uh that level, Mishun Sakana, it's dangerous. Leash Tupo Hamai, we shouldn't be swept away. You know, and I guess uh in Florida get the flooding sometimes. Right? It's all about the alligators also when it floods, and not just the uh the water running in some places. Right? So it's uh it's dangerous. Fourteen. Also, let's see about piv. Dollar pionus al adam yisrael. You're not allowed to say anything that uh, is something bad or dangerous to about an, that, about another Jew. You shouldn't say, you know, um, that it's going. You know, example. I'll just give an example. There's a famous story with Baal Shem Tov that in his shul, uh, one person was had an argument with someone else. And he screamed at him, you know, uh, I could tear you up like a fish. And the Baal showed his students that on a spiritual level, even though it was only an expression, but on a spiritual level, this person was actually tearing him up like a piece of fish. So when a person says something, it, it has power. A person says something, it has, has an effect. It might only be on a spiritual level, it could be in a very... Uh, limited way but has some effect you know i think we've we've all had the experience of just uh you know uh positive energy breeds positive energy and uh the opposite also god forbid and you just be in a in, nothing happened you're just in a room with certain people and the whole energy changes it affects your mood affects how you feel um uh you know obviously th thinking positively uh doesn't necessarily cure someone from from every illness but it's certainly being in a positive frame of mind is is more helpful and beneficial than, than the opposite, God forbid. So we see everything we say has an effect. So we shouldn't say uh, bad things, you know, uh, misfortune about another Jew. So even to say something like, we're so-and-so alive, he would have got here by now. Right? So, um, uh, we're not talking about someone who we know has passed away. He's like saying, you know, what, someone didn't come. He says, well, you know, if he was alive, he'd be here by now. Um, even though he didn't necessarily mean it literally. Because, uh, you know, God forbid, give risk, carousalus of asylum. A covenant has been made with the lips. And, uh, and things can... Sometimes someone saying things, it can it can have an effect. 
A person also, they shouldn't threaten their child. Then it'll be punished with a uh, non-kosher animal. Okay, going for example, don't say that, you know, if you if if you do this or that, a cat or a dog is going to take you away. You shouldn't say things like that. And so to anything similar. The person has to be very mindful and careful of how they speak. It's a person that's just be very careful. Okay. And that is the chapter. Any questions before we move on to the next chapter? At the, at the uh, bottom of this uh, piece here, it says in parentheses, see also chapter 207, law three. Yeah. So um, over there, over there is talking about uh, um, if you have someone that wants to uh, praise Hashem, they want to show how just Hashem is, and they start saying, you know, that so and so was 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 punished um, due to whatever he did. You know, he did this and this. You see how just Hashem is. So even though they're praising Hashem, but they they're saying some negative. About another Jew. And uh, so we shouldn't even do something like that. So we've got to be careful what we say, even with good intentions. You know, this is uh, also, by the way, you know, um, see about doctors, you know, often doctors give a prognosis. And uh, on the one hand, you know, you, you can't give people false hope. And, and if someone uh, needs to take care of their affairs, they should probably be forewarned. But they have to be very careful how they say things. Um, both on a spiritual effect, what they say can have an effect. But even, um, you know, sometimes the difference between making it through is if someone, you know, if it's borderline, someone's determined, they're positive, they, they you know, uh, they can make a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Simon Lama Dala, Chapter 34. Hilcha Sadaka. So we have the law, laws of Sadaka. We're going to uh, loosely translate as charity. Sadaka, of course, it doesn't actually mean charity. Charity in English uh, means that um, I've, someone has, someone else doesn't have, and they don't deserve it, but I'm a nice guy. And uh, out of my niceness, I'll give something to someone else. That, that's charity. Tzedakah, the root of the word is tzedek, which means justice. So Hashem created the world in a way that uh, sometimes one person has excess, and that can be financial, it can be expertise, it can be time, whatever happens to be, and someone else is, uh, is, is lacking. And in Hashem's kindness, Hashem has given us the opportunity to be Hashem's partner in creation. Shem deliberately makes the world imperfect and gives us the opportunity to create the balance and 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 help make it more perfect. So we're fi fin finishing Hashem's creation, so to speak. You know, it's uh, we get to be Hashem's partner. So, so someone's lacking something, someone has extra, and they transfer those resources to the person who needs it. And that's called Sadek, that's called doing the right thing. So Sadaka, yes, it's it's obviously uh anytime someone does the right thing, we can we can we can praise them and 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 use them as examples and and be proud of them. But at the end of the day, it's uh it's 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 the it's one of the right things that there's a the famous story the name of Rujan. Rujan depends where you come from. He uh someone came to him and he needed a, a large sum of money. To um for for a wedding or his children and um came to the original rabbi and he asked for you know for help so he wrote a letter they should go to a certain Jew and live in a certain place and uh, he should give the money so this fellow travels over to, to to the Jew and knocks on the on the door how can I help you and he gives him the letter so the uh the fellow um. 
you know, it was a large sum of money. So he says, you know, look, I don't know you. I don't, I mean, everyone's heard of the, the revolution, but, I, you know, I've never met him. You know, I'm, I'm happy to help. I'll give you this uh, amount. He offered a generous amount, but, uh, you know, I'm not paying that excessive, uh, the full bill. And the fellow says, no, the rabbi told me to come here and take, get the whole amount. So he ups, he, he, he ups his donation a few times. And uh, at a certain point, the fellow he keeps refusing to take partial. He wants the whole thing. He says, okay, you're getting nothing then. See you later. So he goes back. The fellow goes back to the rabbi. The rabbi says, okay. He writes a letter to another Jew. And this first Jew was very wealthy. So now he goes to, uh, this letter was to a, a man of far more limited means. But he saw a letter from the original rabbi asking for the money. He sold the things he had. He borrowed. And uh, he put the money together and he gave it to him. Neither of these two Jews knew each other. But uh, the one who gave slowly starts becoming very rich. And the one who did not give starts becoming uh, the opposite. So uh, he's not a fool. He realizes everything he was he did was successful till he didn't give that money. And he feels it's not fair. He offered a very generous donation. You know, just because he didn't give an excessive amount, how, how come he's losing so he travels to the, the original Rebbe and he complains to him. So the original Rebbe explains to him, he says that before he was born, uh, he saw, before his soul came down to this earth, he saw that he was going to be very rich in order to be able to help many people. But he said uh, in heaven he doesn't want to be rich you know, because managing the money is going to take away from his service of Hashem. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of effort, it's not something he wants. So they said, but you're destined to help. Your job is to come and help these people. So they came to a compromise. What they're going to do is they're going to give the money to certain people. Uh, and they'll be very successful. They can enjoy the money. But when he needs the money, they have to give it, they have to give it to him. And um, he says to this formerly rich man, he says, you are one of those people who were chosen to manage my money. So I sent you the letter, and you didn't give it to me. So I had to give it to someone else that's uh, going to be do, do a better job. So uh, you never know. You know, you, you, you never know uh, why someone has come to this world. Bashanta says uh, a person can spend their entire life, 70, 80 years in this world, and perhaps the only reason they came was to do one favor for another Jew. A physical favor, even. Never mind the spiritual one. So, um, tzedakah is something that's uh, that's 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 very important. Okay, so Aleph number one. Mitzvahs ase litain tzedakah la ni Yisrael. There's a positive mitzvah, positive commandment, that we should give tzedakah to Jewish people in need. People who are who don't have Shnema says, You shall open your hand to him. And if you look in the Hebrew, you see the open, it's a double expression, right? It's the, the word open is repeated twice. Now, in English, you don't, you don't have that. Uh, in, in, in Hebrew, they're often translated as you will surely. Uh, right. We're going to mention that also. But, you know, let's say for an example, the cl probably classic example is when they talk about the uh, the death penalty. In Halacha, it says, most you must, again, a double expression. So they translate, you surely execute him. You know, it's like you're putting an emphasis. But when it's a double expression, it shows how important it is. And so over here, it's, it's, it's not just you should do it. Double expression, you should do it. V'nemar, and it also says, so we've got another another verse, V'chai chicha imcha, sorry, imach, that your brother should live with you. Okay, I mean, doesn't mean he has to move into your house. What it means is that if someone doesn't have the means to get by, you have, every other Jew has a responsibility to ensure this person can survive, has what they need for, for basic living. 
Bechol haroya ani mavakesh, and whoever sees a poor person requesting, and he he literally closes his eyes, but in other words, he ignores him, he makes like he, he doesn't see, and he doesn't give him tzedakah, so not only he did not fulfill the positive commandment, but he's even transgressed a negative commandment. What's that negative commandment? As it says, don't harden your heart and don't close your hand for your destitute brother. So obviously, we're only speaking that someone has the means, right? If someone uh, only has the basic necessities themselves, he's actually not allowed to give tzedakah. There's a question if whether someone who's in large debt is allowed to even give tzedakah. You know, they have to pay their debts first and various things. But um, sauna has, they make like they don't see. It's, it's, they, they transgress. So we see here at least two uh, positive commandments to help another Jew and um, a negative commandment not to ignore the plight of another Jew. Now, we're going to see there's also um, the concept of Sadaq of, of helping society in general. So even the non-Jewish world. You know, Rav Moshe Feinstein used to give to a uh, a, a tremendous amount of tzedakah for his means, for his limited income, including many non-Jewish, he used to give to the blind school and different things. And uh, so much so that he, he got audited by the IRS regularly. They couldn't believe that on this declared income that he was giving away uh, so much. Right? But he lived a very basic life and he gave into general society as well. But on top of the obligation to society as a whole, we have a specific obligation to every other Jew. As we explained about other mitzvahs that we had in the past, we were meant to feel that every Jew is, is our relative, is our brother, and uh, and is an extra responsibility. So, Hatzdaka. Who simon the Zerah of Ramavin. Tzedakah, again, loosely translated as charity. This is a sign, it's a defining characteristic of the descendants of Avramavin, of, of Abraham. You know, it's um and you see, you know, you look in any established Jewish community, there's a they ha, there's a gemach, not it's one gemach, there's there's hundreds. There's gemach, you know, we'll call it a free loan society for financial, and there's med for medical equipment, and there's one for for newborn needs, and there's one for, you know, when, and in, in an established community, someone has a baby and people bring meals, and if God forbid there's a tragedy, people are helping, you know, there's there's uh, burial societies, there's, there's, there's all kinds of things. And that's not to say that there aren't charitable organizations in wider society, but you just can't compare it. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's, you know, just some of the larger Jewish communities sometimes have a little, uh, you know, uh, like free magazines, you know, and it has the, uh, some classifieds and it has, you know, the various stores advertised. And in the back, they have, you know, the list of gamachs. You know the the places where you can borrow things and and table decorations for mitzvahs and and Purim costumes and you know I know uh, in in Florida they have the the winter coat gemach right for people who are traveling to New York or something they can borrow winter coats because for some strange reason in Florida most people don't have one yeah like in Phoenix that's uh. You know that's 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 you see you see this is something that that that's it's unique to the Jewish people. So we see it's it's something that shows, and and there was a a nation you you probably learned about it those who go to the the Tanakh class, who they were were cruel, and they and and David Melech King David says they're not Jewish. These people can't be Jewish. We can't include them. They can't marry into the Jewish people because. If they have such a cruel and obstinate uh, character, this you know this is not the descendant of of Ram. This is this is this is can't be. Uh, this is not the Jewish way. 
Shema says, Ki yedaitiv, ma shi yisaves bono v'goyim u'las yisadoka. He says, Hashem says about Avram, I loved him. Because he commands his children, etc. And one of the things is to do sadaka. Vain kisi yisol miskainen, and uh, even more so, the the seat of Israel, which which means uh, I mean literally seat, but it means the self governance, self rulership of Jews. Vadasa um, emesamedus, and also the the law of truth, and the Torah, is elabas So how how do we how do we maintain uh, Jewish self governance, and how do we What's a major way to make ourselves worthy of being able to grow and succeed in Torah? Sadaka. Shema says, Sadaka to Koinani, establish yourself through Sadaka. God will always Sadaka, Yosem Kabonis, and giving Sadaka. And again, this, as we said, resources, time, energy. Is greater than kabbonis than offering the sacrifices in the base of mikdash. So as important as that is, and we're done for it. You know, we look at the the amidah the shemun esrei. Look how many prayers we have about reestablishing Jerusalem, about about uh, Mashiach coming, about re restarting the offerings, and to uh, and, and rebuilding Jerusalem primarily means building the base of mikdash. So we see uh, how much emphasis there is. Yet one act of sedaka. Is more important. Shnem, as it says, Ois is Daka Mishpat Nibchal Hashem is Beach. So doing Sadaka and the right thing is more preferable to Hashem than, than, than something brought on the, on the altar. So uh, we see how important it is. And we also we also learn that you saw the golden medal of Sadaka. The redemption is only going to come through Sadaka. Sadaka is going to be one of the the major uh, causes of the ultimate redemption. Shema says, but Mishmat Tepado Shavisa Sadaka. Sorry, Sion, but Mishmat Tepado Shavisa Sadaka. Zion will be redeemed through Mishpat, through justice, and those who return to her through Sadaka, through charity. So um, that's 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 how important it is. And he continues, No one's going to become poor through giving tzedakah. Now, as, we, as we're going to learn, the right law is about giving. You know, a person shouldn't give away everything they have. Having said that, there's time and place also. There was there was uh, stories that, you know, during the, the Holocaust example, um, when it came to sponsoring people, there was uh, limited opportunities to be the sponsor people and, and bring them to America. There were certain people who gave away everything they had to save save their lives. You know, that was literally because Nefush, life threatening situation, as we know, life threatening situation um overrules many things. But under normal circumstances, a person is not allowed to give away everything. But if a person gives away a sadaka in the way that Torah ex expects or wants, the person will never become poor. Then Dava Ravala Hizikba. Nothing bad will happen to him. Person is not going to suffer through giving Bishvil Sadaka because Sadaka. How do we know this? Shnamaz says, The the product, the end result of Sadaka is Shalom. Now, Shalom we we translate just as peace, but it but it means much more than that. Shalom means a certain level, um, you know, Shalom is is like a harmonious balanced, complete, peaceful time, you know? You know, technically we have a, uh, for example, Israel has a, has a peace treaty with Egypt, right? But in the meantime, they're uh, published, the, they've got television shows of the elders of Zion and there's the anti-Semitic press and they uh, have very... Uh, They often don't notice things being smuggled into Gaza, you know, to put it nicely, you know, etc. So although that is a peace, technically, peace meaning the absence of war, but it's it's not shalom. Shalom means like, uh, that's so much so when we talk about our colors, 
on Shabbos when they're meant to be whole. Call them shleimus. It's the same word that the whole. It's complete. So uh, shalom is uh, means that things are going to be the way that it should be. So giving tzedakah is uh, incredible. Furthermore, call marachim marachim alof. Whoever shows rachmanus will loosely translate as mercy. But again, that's lack of proper translation in English. But we look at people the way that we should. We treat them that the way that Hashem wants us to do. Then that's how Hashem treats us. Hashem says, "Nosen l'cho rachim rachamecha rebecho." Says he who will give mercy, I'll be merciful to you and multiply you. Achzari, the someone who's cruel. We have to be suspect of his uh, Jewish lineage. Right? So um in general, we have this concept of midda kinek midda, the Hashem treats us the way that we treat others. So if uh we have patience for people that try our patience. Very easy to have patience for the people who make us uh, happy. But if we have patience for those who uh, who try our patience, then Hashem shows certain patience to us. It's uh, what we show is important. That's the way Hashem treats us. So um, that's the positive. And uh, we just, we just learned to the end of the, uh, Last chapter, not to mention the negative, so we'll 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 leave that out. It's implied, but um, if if we can give and we can show a certain uh, mercy, a, a concern, and a care for others, you know, it's sometimes even uh, beyond what we normally call the call of duty. It could be it's not even what Hashem expects as a call of duty, but beyond what society normally calls the call of duty. Then that's how Hashem treats us. And uh, only speaking for myself, I'm far from perfect. Uh, so um, I could do with a little bit of mercy from Hashem. Maybe a lot of bit. So we said uh, Hashem treats us the way that we treat others. If a person is cruel, the, the Jewish lineage is suspect. And even more so, the Kodesh Baruch Hu Koro Yiv the Shavas and Niim. Hashem is close to the the request, the crying out of the poor. Shema says, "With Saaka Saniyim Mishma," and Hashem hears the cry of the poor. Now, in general, anyone who's oppressed, anyone who who uh, is suffering, who is lacking, they cry from the depths of their heart. It uh, when a person is sincere, it, it it goes up high. Who was known for doing the So a person has to be uh, careful of when they hear the cry out, they have to be careful about it. So a special covenant was made with them. Shema says, like, So it would be that if he cries out to me, I'll listen, I'm compassionate. The Amr be Shalmi. And in the, the Talmud Yishalmi, the Jerusalem Talmud, which was not made in Jerusalem, but it was made in Israel, but nevertheless, it's its name. Torah the Lord to Pasach Lanya says there's a gate that is uh, not opened before the poor, that to Pasach Asya, that will be opened before a doctor or a physician. Right? So in other words, he says, if someone, it's it's a, it's a curse, God forbid, you know, if someone doesn't open his door to the needy, uh, he'll end up having, God forbid, to open the door to uh, to the doctor. You know, it's a... Be it in the a liboy, so a person should take this to heart. That when he regularly asks Hashem to sustain him, give him his sustenance, ask Hashem for his livelihood, just as he requests, he's desiring that Hashem should listen to his prayer and support him and give him what he needs. So too, that person should listen to the requests of the needy. A person should also take the heart to give the 
that the, the world is a, it's a turning wheel, right? It's a cycle. What goes around comes around. And ultimately, it can come, come about that he or his child, the grandchild, they'll need tzedakah. Right? The wealthy today can, can, God forbid, not be wealthy in the future and vice versa. A person shouldn't say, How can I uh, diminish my, my funds by giving to the poor? Right? The person shouldn't have that attitude. He has to know that in fact, his money is not his own money. It's a deposit. It's something that he's watching. Last says by Rotson and Mafkid, and why does he have it? In order to fulfill the will of the one who deposited by him. And Allah Hashem. Shem gives us money to do what we need to do. So part of that, yes, is that we have to have housing and we have to support our family. And we uh, have to on a Shabbos by having nice meals and and we're meant to dress decently and all these things. So Hashem wants that we spend. Part of the money on ourselves, but we also for mitzvahs, and that's our own mitzvahs. For example, to fill them with an esrog and the various things, but there's also mitzvahs that affect others, giving sedaka. and the the part that he gives to sedaka is what's truly his. Right? There's uh, the the story that Sir Moses Montefiore was once asked by the. I think it was Queen Victoria. I'm not exactly sure who it was. How much money he has. So he asked uh, some time to do a calculation. This is at the peak of his uh, uh, richness. And he came with a, he came back with a certain figure. And she says she she was upset. Whoever was upset with him, you know, you're, you're, you're not telling the truth. You have much more than that. He says, no, no. This is what I've given to Sadaka. So that's what's truly mine. Money can be lost tomorrow. You know, what's in your bank account, the house, God forbid, it can be lost tomorrow, God forbid. But what I've given to Sadaka that I truly own. So we call them because after a person gives Sadaka, all that's what remains with him after all his toil in this world. Right? When a person goes next world, his, his house doesn't come with him. The Siva says, your tzedaka will precede you. But tzedaka, and even more than this, tzedaka can push away and suspend uh, evil decrees, and can add life. So, tzedaka. Well, I guess we finish up here for today. Any, any, any questions? Yeah. Well, I wish everyone a wonderful Rosh Chodesh and Rosh Chodesh tonight. It's already Rosh Chodesh here. And Shem uh, should bless us. Rosh Chodesh. This Tishabah, we don't need to pass. Shem should bless us. We'll have the base of Mikdash already. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.